this is uh this question actually is uh okay so the question is hi i've been watching your live bible studies and they've been really helpful for me in understanding the gospel of grace when i get scared i often put your videos on so i can sleep i guess i could be a babe in christ and i sometimes get scared that i was never saved i'm afraid that first john 2 19 speaks directly to me can you tell me what the whole chapter is about and if you want me to read uh, 1 John 2.19, I can do that. Um, it is, uh, and I, I, this is another verse that's often used and misabused. It says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be, so that they might be manifest that none of them were of us. Did you, want me, to, thing, uh, yeah. did you want me to go first on that, Luke? Or, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's your turn to go first, Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. It was I thought it was to me. I wanted Renee to read it, and you go. You oh, answer sorry. first. If, sorry. If, if you want, Renee can go first. If you yeah, ready. go ahead, Renee. If you want, okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, I'm sure we'll both say something just fantabulous. First <laughs> uh, John two. Well, first question I would ask the questioner is: Are you antichrist? Because not talking about you unless you're Antichrist. Uh, they went out from us because they were Antichrist. Re go up a couple of verses. See, you can't just pull something out of context and scare people with it. All right, little children. This is, you're asking about 219. I'm going one verse up to 218. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. So who went out of us? These Antichrists. Earlier in the book, I think it's actually in the last chapter or the first chapter it says he who denies the son is antichrist who denies jesus has come in the flesh is antichrist it might be in the next chapter but uh the actual book of first john has a lot of content it's dividing uh truth from error it's dividing uh uh how to have fellowship, those that are saved from those that are not. It's dividing um, uh, the real Jesus Christ from the false Christ. It's dividing Antichrist from Christ. It's dividing a lot of things. Uh, it's comparing this to that all throughout the book. Uh, but it's mostly about fellowship. Fellowship with God, fellowship with the brethren. Because the purpose of the letter is to make sure you're saved so you get really scared and question yourself. The purpose of the letter is not that. The purpose of the letter is so your joy may be full. That's the purpose of the letter. I write to you so that your joy may be full. So if this letter is not helping edify you so that you can move to a path that makes your joy more full, we're not reading it correctly, okay? If you're uh, scared, condemned, confused, then we're not reading it correctly because your joy will be full. This is instruction on closeness, intimacy with God, intimacy with the brethren, standing on true foundations, resting in Christ, and making our faith living faith. These little children, my little children, does it sound like he's angry? My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he's talking to his little children, the believers, about their joy being full and how they can have a stronger faith and fellowship with God and fellowship with the brethren. So unless you're the antichrist that he's speaking about here, 
Uh, no, that verse is not talking about you be, not being of us because you had a crisis of faith. It's nothing about that. Now, I do believe there are people that claim to be Christian. They claim to have been pastors and then they left. I believe they were never of us. They didn't have the Holy Spirit because in the next verse, he says, but we have an unction from the Holy One. We've got the Holy Spirit. So I do believe there are people that profess Christ, never trusted him, thought they were saved by Jesus plus their works, got tired of having to live up to an impossible standard. And rather of than getting broken and coming to God like they should have and repented and said, I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I need his blood. That's it. And that's what we're all supposed to do. It's what the law is supposed to do, make us guilty. Uh, instead, they left. They left because they couldn't they, they couldn't live up to it. And so they ended up hating God and leaving. I believe they were never of us. But this particular verse is referring to Antichrist that denies something important about who Jesus is, whether he came in the flesh or something, denied his resurrection, something that makes them Antichrist. And he lists several things. Uh, so no, this this would certainly not be about you. I'm going to do another study on First John because this just disturbs people so badly. And that's the opposite of what the purpose of the letter is for, is to make you joyful. So hopefully uh, that will help you get some rest. Okay, thank you. All right, Brother Ben, what do you say? Uh, I, well, I, well, first I'll say is, um, you know, I, would, I wouldn't recommend you do this, but um, for me, I started uh, with all the. My, I started my deepest studies on the most difficult books of the Bible, so Hebrews, First John, Second Peter, Jude, uh, and I, you know, I studied the heck out of those things. So I, I feel like like First John, Hebrews, Second Peter. I feel like I have a really good understanding of those, of, of those books because I just spent so much time thinking about it and reading it over and over again. Uh, and so I think, I, yeah, First John is very problematic if you don't read it carefully. And I mentioned this before, but First John has what's known as ubiquitous shorthand. So he expects you to import uh, certain teachings that uh, he definitely would have taught this this church earlier on, especially in his gospel. So there's a lot of uh, things that John uh, further elaborates uh, in his epistles that he that were in seed form, if you will, in his in his gospel. So, like for example, in First John 15. He talks about abiding, and like Renee said, the overall idea of the epistle is all about abiding, and abiding essentially means fellowship with God, fellowship with fellow your fellow believers. It's intimacy. It's knowing God at a experiential level, and that's why you see things like, oh, he who hates his brother doesn't know God, or 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 things like that. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you can't say that he's telling you to rebuke these people. Like, say for example. You can't say that you're abiding in Christ at the same time hating your brother because these false teachers, which I believe held to an early form of Gnosticism, and Gnosticism basically taught, oh, well, first of all, these false teachers said that Christ didn't come in the flesh, and they, they held to many other uh, heretical doctrines, damnal heresies, if you will. If you will. And um, they... Um, they So they held these false doctrines, plus they also believed that somehow uh light and darkness had could have fellowship with each other like they were evil and good and evil were somehow symbiotic that's what they taught and that's why you see all these stark contrasts in this epistle about you know that's why he says you know definitively without any uh qualms saying you know in god uh, uh you know god is light and in him there's no darkness at all because these false teachers were saying no yeah god is both good and evil um, and so that's why you see these stark contrasts, these very difficult verses, for example, who says, you know, for example, in 1 John 3, 4, verses 4 through 9, says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him there is no sin. So again, these false teachers were teaching that in him there is sin. Who, whoever abides in him does not sin. Again, doesn't mean you're going to be sinless, but while you're abiding in him, you can't say, oh, I've, I I know him, I've seen him, and I know him. Like, you've come back from being full, filled with the Spirit and come back and say, I know him, and, I, and I, I've seen him. Like, just like for example, when you're seeing someone special, 
you you, you you know, you say I'm seeing someone. Well, in the same way, John's using that same kind of idea. Like you're seeing it them at an intimate level. Like, uh, you know, he, so someone can't say, a believer can't say, I know him and I see him. And then at the same time, hate his brother. He's not, he can't say he's simultaneously abiding in him and sinning and hating his brother. Um, so it's really about, hey, God abides in you. Now the question is, you abide in him. And that's even captured in the statement um, where it says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need to, that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it taught you, you abide in him. So he's saying basically that you have anointing, you have the Holy Spirit you that teaches you all truth, and so you don't need to learn anything new from these Gnostics because these Gnostics taught specialized knowledge, like secret knowledge. They thought taught salvation through secret knowledge. And he's saying, no, you don't, you don't need what they're teaching. Uh, you, you have the Holy Spirit. You what, Hold on to what you heard from the beginning because they, they come and say, oh, you, there's something more. Uh, you know, th their draw was knowledge. Uh, that's what Satan does. He, uh, he whispers, you know, secret knowledge. In fact, the temptation in the garden... Um, when it says the serpent, the serpent um, is a, the word it used there is also used for the Old Testament word for a diviner, someone who whispers secret knowledge. So again, that's what they taught salvation through knowledge, and um, so I, I could say so much more about these, this this book. It's a fascinating, but it's basically about hey, God is light, God is love. All the fruits of the Holy Spirit are. Uh, if, I, again, I see this all the time, but God is like, I see God kind of like a circle, and in there is all light, love, and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And then outside that circle, or pr his protective main membrane, or his fortress, is the law, and everything outside is uh, under the condemnation of the law. And it, it, you know that's where you have evil and darkness and everything else. And he's basically saying, hey, everything bored outside of that, you know, anyone that is bored... In fact, it even says in this verse, it's very, you know, you know, it, it, he says, whoever sins is of the devil. Well, guess what? Everyone, we're our old man born outside under the law uh, on the earth. Uh, that, that sphere of condemnation is of the devil. Our old man is of the devil. You're, you're operating under the influence of the devil when you sin. You're reflecting his character. And but we, when you're born again, you have a new man born from above. And so we should operate under that. We should abide under that that new man, in that new man, that new teaching. So again, he just teaching, you know, there's stark contrast because these false teachers taught that there was a good and evil could coexist. And they taught that Christ didn't come to the flesh. So they were antichrists. And in fact, um, proof that these people were not saved. Well, actually, let me back up because I think this is very important. Let's read 1 John 1. Real quick, I, I don't want to belabor this too much, but I think it's too much. This is very important. The epistle opens up with that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes. Who say who see God with their own eyes? Which have we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which is what the which 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 was with the Father. And was manifested to us. So who is the us and the you? Well, I think it's pretty clear if you study this. He's John is talking about us. He says us. He's talking about the, the apostles. Only the apostles really, the closest disciples, handled the word of life. They touched Christ. They saw Christ with their own eyes. They bore witness. And he's they're declaring as a faithful witness to his uh, audience of this epistle that these are the things that we saw. So he says us and we... Um, the us is the is the apostles. So when it says they 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 did not remain with us, when it says in First John two nine, when it says they did not um, abide with us, we just looked it up real quick here. Um, they went out from us. Yes, they went out from us. Well, the us there, I believe, is the the the, the apostles in the Jerusalem church. They went out from us, and it, it's not saying oh. Uh, every person who, who departs from uh, a fellowship of believers is antichrist. No, he's just saying that these got this was God's way of showing the apostles that there were people that uh, that were not in agreement with their doctrine, and that they were actually going to leave 
and try to go out to the churches and uh, draw disciples over to their false doctrine. And so it was God's way of warning them that uh, these people, they left from us. They left the, the close new, knit group of apostles at Jerusalem. And uh, that, that, that's how, why God, that Paul, John is now warning them that, that, you know, hey, we know these people are coming. That's why he says many antichrists are coming. In fact, the fact that he says that's we know, we know it's the last days, uh, little children, it is the last hour, as you have heard, Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, which we have known, at w by which we know it is the last hour. So again, these Antichrists were never saved. In fact, they're prefiguring, they're, they're, they're a type for the man of sin. And by the way, this is very interesting too. Again, I'll make this last point here. This is evidence that these, these Antichrists were never saved. So... Uh, for example, in 1 John 1.19, he contrasts them who are of God versus uh, these unbelievers who are of the world. Again, whenever the Bible says of the world, it's under the sphere of condemnation. It means you're not, it's not part of God's kingdom. It's, it's, it's part of the fallen world that's going to be condemned. Uh, and so he says in 1 John 1.19, you are of God, little children, and overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They, these false teachers, are of the world. Um, so again, they were unsaved. That whenever the Bible says you're of the world, uh, that means you're that, where, that at that point in time you're unsaved. Um, and also, too, this is a last point, very critical here. The Greek informs us that they these, these people were never believers. When it says they were not of us, the Greek says the, the Greek is is a. Uh, it says, so when John, I'm reading from the quick commentary here, it says, when John describes these antichrists in 2.19, notice what he does say and what he does not say. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. He does not say, they went out from us, but they are not of us. John used the imperfect indicative isan, they were, rather than the present sin they are to show that these antichrists did not merely deny Christ at the time John was writing but they had denied him in the past which precipitated their departure um and again the us and we those are dative nouns that that also shows that they the us is the the apostles so uh, I could go on to much more I, I agree with today I would love to do a more thorough teaching in fact I, I can't wait until Wednesday Bible study we get to these more difficult um, epistles because I've got a lot of ammunition. That was brilliant. Right. Well, uh, uh, you you both uh, did a very good and thorough job on that first part of the question. I won't need to add much. I'll just summarize that uh, in Christendom, and when the word Christendom is used, you, you should understand that um, all the people in the world, uh, now and in the past, who identify themselves as some kind of a Christian. That's what the word Christendom is. Uh, now, of all Christendom, there are many different denominations, over, over uh, 30,000 or 40,000 denominations, I believe now. Uh, and uh, so there's sects and denominations and uh, uh, all these different uh, types of Christians. But we know that there's only one real Christian. I call it Christian because... Uh, a Christian is someone who, who believes what the Bible says about Christ and salvation, that uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, our salvation is only because of what Jesus has done for us and his promise to us, not anything that we do, uh, faith alone in Christ alone. That's, that's what a Christian is, someone who's relying completely on Christ. But I would say 90%, probably more, of all Christendom, all the people who say they're a Christian of some sort, um, the 90%, they don't believe it, the gospel the way we do, that, that there's no works required. So um, now uh, the Bible does tell warn us, not only here, okay, here Renee point out that, well, let's talk about Antichrist. Uh, and, and then we know that uh, in uh, uh, Galatians, uh, these, these people are people who believed, they have the Holy Spirit, and uh, the, over and over again, the, it refers to them as Christian within, with, with various terminology. Uh, there should be no confusion that, that uh, Galatians is written to believers. However, they're being chastised because they have uh, believed what the false teacher said, that Paul was a false teacher, and that you've got to not just believe in Jesus, 
but you got to also practice Judaism, faith plus religious works. So uh, that's the lordship. Uh, and that's the beginnings of the lordship, uh, you know, uh, false gospel. Um, but the Bible says that uh, in the church, you're going to have wheat and tares, people sitting right next to each other on the pew. The wheat's the real Christian. The, the tares is, it could be someone who is deceived and doesn't understand and believe correctly. It could be someone who's deceiving us, pretending that they're actually a Christian for some malicious reason. Um, so we know that there are some who are truly Christians but get led into apostasy. There are some that never were, they were antichrist and that, that good, be gone with them. Uh, they never were with us, as Renee said. Uh, and so um, we need to be aware of all these things and uh, it's a simple test. Just ask anybody, are you certain you're gonna go to heaven and why? And if a person says, I'm certain I'm going to go to heaven, it's, it's a blessed assurance. I'm assured of heaven because Jesus paid for my sins and I, he was raised from the dead bodily to, to guarantee eternal life to those who believe in him as I do. So um, it's just a simple test. But if they answer the question, well, I go to church and I follow the golden rule and, and I follow the Ten Commandments, I, 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 I do so much, I think the Lord will accept me in the end. That's, that's a, a false gospel of... Uh, self-righteousness. So all these things do exist and the, the epistles are filled with accounts of these various people. So that's the beginning of, of the, the, the question. But nobody addressed the second part of the question yet. So let me let me uh, talk about that for a second. They say, I also want to hear a Bible study on Romans 2 and what it is talking about or who it is talking about. Well, I mean, you're asking a lot for a Sunday church service to, we're not, we cannot divert from our regular program to, to go through Romans chapter two, a verse at a time for you now. However, on Wednesday night, we did a complete study verse by verse of the book of Romans. You can find it there. And the interesting thing about Romans chapter one and two, uh, I, I, I presented a, a viewpoint of those first two chapters that you, if you will listen and hear me out, you'll see that it is something you've probably never heard of before. And the, I think the title of some, one of the videos is called, Was Paul a Diatribalist? Prosopopoeia. Prosopopoeia is, is a word, it's a, it's a Greek word that refers to a, um, a method or a technique in, in uh, oratory that was used at the time. Paul used it uh, throughout his letters, but much more so in Romans, the first two chapters, um, Brother Cripps and I, uh, we went through the first two chapters the way that we, we believe that uh, it should be understood. And that is, Paul is not writing his teaching in chapter one and two entirely. He's writing the teachings of the false teacher and can then contrasting it with what he says. Um, often, if you go through the Pauline epistles, you'll see that he uses um, rhetorical questions. He asks questions that are, the answer is obvious. And this is another version of that. So uh, if, if you will go and listen to chapter one and chapter two of Romans, you'll see that we we play it out like a play. Uh, I think uh, Brother Cripps or, or one of us played Paul and the other one played uh, the false teachers that are pursuing Paul and arguing against him. So Paul, I think, instructed Chloe, or maybe it was Phoebe, I don't remember, to uh, not only take the letter to the church, but to read it to the church, but read it in a way where she could, uh, it would cl be clear to everybody that she is presenting the false teacher and then Paul's answer, the false teacher and Paul's answer. So uh, it's fascinating. And I hope you will uh, um, pay attention to that. And uh, I, I'm convinced that that's the way we should uh, understand one and two of Romans. But uh, many other people have other ways of interpreting it. Uh, I certainly don't want anybody to interpret it in a way that it's imposing works on people. But, <clears throat> okay, uh, do you guys want to say anything more about that second part of the question? Rene or yes. Ben? Yes, I totally agree with you, Luke. Uh, Romans 2 is often used by Lord Shippers again. That, that they, you read Romans, t uh, Romans uh, uh, verse chapter 2, verse 10. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who work who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, uh, you know, who people who do patient, who patiently endure and, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it says 
who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who, by patient continuance and doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. He's using, like you said, Luke, a rhetorical device. He's basically laying out the case in Romans 1 and 2, and actually Romans 1 through 3, that there's universal condemnation and that he's trying to pound out any hope whatsoever that anyone would have in their performance or their flesh or whatsoever. And verse 2, he's basically laying it out, okay, well, uh, you know, yeah, you, theoretically, again, uh, hear me out, theoretically, you could earn eternal life. And in that sense, Christ earned it, eternal life because he was the only one who, who by patient continuance and doing good, seek glory and honor, uh, it, for immortality, he was the only one that was able to ascend to heaven, like we t we talked about last week. As a man, um, you know, he he was the only one able to, was able to meet those uh, those impossible demands for righteousness. And uh, he's trying to pound out, like I said, every hope that anyone would have for anything. He says over and over again that we're all under sin, and that you know, are we any better? No, we're certainly not any better than anyone else. We're sinners just like everyone else, and. The only difference is, is that believers do not suppress the truth and unrighteousness, but they believe it. And so in that sense, they obey the gospel, which is another, which is a synonym for uh, believing. So I'm 100% I'm uh, agree with you. Romans 12 should not cause you any fear whatsoever. Romans 2, I should yeah, say. I, I, I agree with that. Um, yeah, I think the whole point of it, uh, the chapter is to say, what benefit is it to be in a Jew? Why why are you trying to tell Gentiles that they need to do Jewish customs? Like that's going to make them better. Like if you look at it, they they think, you know, well, salvation is of the Jews. And so the whole point here is is like not the not the hearers of the law, but doers of the law justify. Meaning just because the Jews heard the law, were given the law, doesn't make them any more righteous. Because all of sin and comes to all, it says the judgment is upon everyone. Those who are under those who uh, are under the law and those who are not under the law, everyone perishes. The death sentence is upon everyone, and so that that's the whole context of the chapter. So um, I do think it's just a general general statement, but. Honestly, if it's obeying the truth, it would be to believe the gospel. And the only people that can do anything good would be saved people because we can't do anything without Christ. So if you want to put the verse technically that way, but it is to me, Paul just making a general statement about the Gentiles who never heard the law. Uh, their righteousness is just as righteous as a Jew that's under the law. So if he never heard thou shalt not steal, but still doesn't steal, and a Jew heard thou shalt not steal and doesn't steal, why does it make a Jew any more righteous than the one that ha didn't have the law? And and that's the whole purpose of it. I, I believe that's the whole uh, context of Romans 2 anyway. So when we pull out a verse like that and take it out of the original meaning as a whole, that's where we run into problems. It's it's like how every heresy I was looking earlier today and noticed every ancient heresy. And by the way, a lot of them were coming back like modalism and Pelagianism. I didn't know they had names for them, but they're coming back. And it's all because they only looked at one side pieces of verses that supported their position and ignored the entire counsel of God. Like they didn't look at it as a whole and tried to pull. And you'll see people nitpicking about words, you know. Uh, well, it says that they might be able to. So that means there no might is so you, therefore could be possible. Like they, they look for anything to have bad news. And so it, to me, if, if, if people pull that verse out of its context i think you know ben made a good point it's about the entirety it's a an entire point being made that you're it's gonna cause confusion